Okay, so boom. You're chosen to write this college trilogy, Spider-Man 4. Whatever they're calling this new Spider-Man movie that's gonna be Spidey's next solo outing since the box office titan that was Spider-Man No Way Home. Scorsese and Tom Holland are throwing subliminal disses through interviews like Drake and Common in 08. And more people want The Amazing Spider-Man 3 starring Jewish King, real life Peter Parker, Andrew Garfield, than another MCU outing. So, I say we take four years in between movies. That way, younger fans of the movies could get older in real life and ready up for the mature storylines that we could present down the line. Elevator pitch. Twin Peaks meets MCU. I aim to adapt the 1985 spectacular Spider-Man Death of Gene DeWolf arc written by Peter David and Rich Buckler, but replace the death of Gene DeWolf with the death of Betty Brant. We already know her from the previous trilogy, so it would be easier for audiences to get attached to her once she dies. LOL, spoiler alert. If you don't know what this story arc is, just Google it for five seconds. You don't need the overview to listen to this. I already took very few liberties with the story. I only got rid of the part really where Sin Eater has superpowers, because that's like stupid. Okay. After Betty Brant is murdered in a failed attempt on J. Jonah Jameson's life, detectives Gene Wolfe and street cop Stan Carter are called to the Daily Bugle to investigate. Gene knows one thing. They were out to get J. Jonah Jameson. She knows that because it's J. Jonah Jameson. So they interview him. He starts naming off all these names. Matt Gargan, Wilson Fisk, and Spider-Man, whatever that kid's name is. Spider-Man is instantly written off as innocent in like the next scene because you know how much Tom loves to take his mask off. So he just tells her like the kind-hearted dummy he is. And she happens to be in the minority of New Yorkers that respect Spider-Man. So now it's on to the next. First is Wilson Fisk, but he's out of both of our heroes' tax brackets, so they can't reach him alone. Peter remembers his lawyer who helped with his case when people remembered who he was, and while doing some research, he sees that in 2014, he has had a long, tumultuous relationship with the very man he's been looking for. This leads Gene and Pete to Foggy Nelson and Matt Murdock. They meet for the first time again, chat about being a lot alike, and Matt says something along the lines of him hearing Peter on the roof before he came in or something. You know, blind man powers. Matt and Pete rule out the possibility of Wilson Fisk doing anything himself, like getting his hands dirty because of his current incarceration, but they don't rule out many of his henchmen. Matt gives the info of Gargan, stating that he keeps an eye on him all the time. So no, Wilson Fisk is not going to be in this movie. I don't think I would like him to be if I were making this movie. Um, that would just make it too cluttered. At Betty's funeral, another murder attempt happens. This time Jonah is grazed. And Horace Rosenthal, a mentor of Matt Murdock and a judge in Hell's Kitchen, is undone by the perpetrator sawed off. He goes back to Hell's Kitchen knowing that Horace sentenced Matt Gargan and Adrian Toomes in 2017. After hearing this, Matt's all like, Gargan might be the one committing these heinous crimes. You know, these not alivings. This also starts a B-plot where Stan Carter, Eddie Brock, and Jolly Jameson are working together to solve the crime, but only because they see Gene and Pete do it. But, you know, as per usual, they're one step behind the two, um, the entire time. Jonah sees bits of him and Eddie and realizes that he's an asshole and needs to chill on being an Aiden ass nigga. A little bit of then and meanwhile, if you're a writer, you know what then and meanwhile is. A plot. They track down Matt Gargan. He's in Harlem and he's on parole staying with his mom. At first he's all apprehensive thinking they're there for something else. Jean does her bad cop thing. She yells and grills when Gargan doesn't budge. But they both know he's hiding something. And later that night, Spider-Man comes back, crawling in the shadows in an attempt to scare information out of Gargan. But Gargan still knows him as a little kid, so he's like, yo, doesn't work. You put me in jail, I don't care about going to jail. Peter's like, I won't tell Gene where I got the information from. We just know you know something, and you're starting to annoy me. He hits him a few times, pulls out a picture of Betty, you know, some Spider-Man interrogation shit. He's like, yo, like, I won't tell Gene, just tell me. I sold it to a cop, that's all I know. I sold the gun to a cop. Spider-Man leaves. Mac Gargan is killed. Upon hearing this, Peter tries and fails to reach Gene DeWolf the morning after. He calls Matt and Foggy instead, and they suggest they knock on Gene's door. As soon as he lands on her fire escape, his fire sense goes off like crazy, and he walks in and sees her on the ground, barely alive. After getting her to the hospital, we cut to Jonah, Eddie, and Stan in a car, talking about how stumped they are. Stan behind the wheel, something's off. In the corner of his eye, he notices a gun that looks all too familiar. Jonah then calls Gene but just to record the call. Spidey is by Jean's side and hears the entire thing. She then dies in the hospital and a vengeful Peter goes straight for Stan. Once at his apartment, he finds a manifesto detailing future murders and his future suicide, uh, respectively. He gets Eddie and Jonah out, tells them to, you know, don't put their heads where they don't belong, and then he beats the living crap out of Sin Eater. You took two of my closest friends. I don't ever know how I'll recover. 
but stuff like this happens all the time. I'm Spider-Man, I'll get back up again. Spider-Man leaves into the cops because, you know, that's what Spider-Man does, he doesn't kill. Um, Sin Eater is picking up his gun to commit the suicide that he wrote about, and the cops shoot him before he can do that because they think he's going to kill them. So, Sin Eater dies, uh, Gene DeWolf is dead, Spider-Man has two close friends that he is now lost with nothing gained.